Okay. So I, I left off by addressing God as Samia last time. And I said, I will discuss as -salam. I already have a video on a Shaheed, a witness. I'm going to redo it because the sound has been not well. I was sick at the time. So I hope to redo that in the future. And I already did one on Shakur. I will post that soon. So I'm going to continue. Today's presentation is going to be on as -salam. And I'm hoping to use the Prophet Abraham's journey to discuss as -salam. I can just fix this a bit. Okay. It's important to look at the word salam, which means peace, but to also take the three root letters, which is sin, lam, mim. And if you take those root letters and you go through the Quran, for example, and you put in those root letters and look for all the verses of the Quran, you know, where derivatives or the root letters are seen lam mim you will find that there is one verse in the quran that points to god as salam uh it could be the source of peace another interpretation is um the perfect one the one who's um devoid of any defect or imperfections when it comes to human beings like us, there are many words that describe our interactions, our greetings, uh, our faith that all come from the root letters, seen, nam, me. If one looks at the full context of all of these words, what you have is, with respect to human beings, it's about surrender. Salam with respect to human beings is surrendering to God's will. And through that surrendering to God's will, we enter into peace or wholeness. So many seek peace by struggling, battling, and trying to impose their will on others. Yet external peace will only prevail as a reflection of inner peace. The only path to outer peace is awareness of the tranquil depths of inner peace. Um, and the only source of such inner peace is the one known as as -salam. Upon reflection of this attribute of God, as well as I said, if you go through the Quran and just type seen, nam, meme as the letters, you come to understand that we come into, like, we submit our will by basically uh, following the commands of Allah. And that means that we have come to self resignation. We've accepted that God knows more than we know. So we all have that struggle that we have to go through to submit our will to Allah. And right now we're in the month of Al Hijjah, where all of us are reflecting on the story of Prophet Abraham and how he manifested to us um, this realization and this faith put in practice of surrendering one's will to God. Story of Prophet Abraham. Now, the reason I mentioned Abraham out of other prophets in this particular uh, book and the emphasis was because of the fact I'll talk about this the Sarah and Hajar story and how this has played out to create um, tension or to create animosity between Muslims and people and people of other faiths. Our narrative of Prophet Abraham, I don't want to mention or, or promote the work of others, but 
for the reason of that they were attacking Prophet Abraham, calling him such things as narcissistic and a deadbeat dad, and, and other things that are totally like not in line with our understanding of the faith, which is again surrendering to God's will. It's best for us to explore our narrative of Prophet Abraham and how we understand his journey. And in order to do so, like I said, you cannot reflect on any prophet's story and journey without first and foremost connecting to Prophet Muhammad upon him. peace and blessings. He is also the pure one who God entrusted with the correct narrative, the correct reality of the prophets in the past. No other human being was entrusted with that knowledge, with that inspiration. So when we discuss and we explore the story of Prophet Abraham, we go through the door and we go through the life journey of Prophet Muhammad upon a piece of blessings. None of the prophets that we try to like share their narrative or their story that we can, for example, do so without going through the door of Prophet Muhammad upon a piece of blessings. He nurtured his community during his lifetime such that they went from being at war with each other, talking about Prophet Muhammad, to build communities of peace with each other and with other communities of faith. So with the attribute of God's name, as -Salam, it means the perfect one. When we're speaking about Islam or Salam amongst Muslims, we're speaking about surrendering to God's will so that we can free ourselves from the impurities that we absorb from society and be at peace with ourselves as well as with each other. If you've ever tried to make peace between people, I'm going to give an example shortly that I have experienced over the years when I had a discussion about peacemaking. You might have encountered many difficulties or a dead end in learning about the prophet's lives. We know to turn to God and pray to be instruments of peace. None of us are going to be again at the station of Prophet Muhammad upon him. Peace of blessings. He's the final messenger of God. Without his guidance and surrendering our will to him, God, we will continue to be at war within ourselves and each other to know how to surrender to him, to know the guidance. It's not just you know theory, but the guidance, the commands, uh, the work that needs to be done can only do so through reflecting on the life journey as well as uh, the teachings of Prophet Muhammad upon it, peace and blessings. I want to share that I, I've shared it more than once, that the worst leaders are those who anger you and whom you anger. They curse you and you curse them. At first, I understood it as if you hated a leader, that meant the person was a bad leader. This, however, leads to a vicious cycle of hate and anger. If we're constantly like, I hate you, and I hate you, and I hate you, and I hate you. And so we're constantly in this vicious cycle of hate and anger. When words fail, the prophets teach us to turn the matter over to God and to pray. A good fight doesn't mean we do not act, like I said. It just means that we take action. We do not fight with hatred and a mindset that condemns people. Instead, we offer people doors to forgiveness from God and reparation. Words fail, we turn to the source of peace, as -salam. So we, we all want peace. All of us, we want peace. It's, it's a normal. Out of peace comes security, not just 
physical security, mental, emotional, social security. And I have sections in this book that deal with these um, transgressions at various uh, aspects of our being. We should pray, um, asking God to help us to be individuals that are open to peace and are open more first and foremost, as we will learn from right now, and as I show about Prophet Abraham, that open to surrendering our will and to give us the, you know, the gift of grace, you know, because we're always asking God for everything, but to give us the gift of grace such that we can surrender our will to his commands as it pleases him. Recognizing and using our wisdom, knowing that when we do so, we become instruments of peace and we can be sure that we are protecting others from our harm. If we do not do so, we do not surrender our will. We may not be aware of it. We may not be cognizant of it. Uh, either Satan may have made our deed pleasing to us, but we may be actually engaging kind of an ego fight. And again, that vicious cycle of hate keeps going, but we may be actually harming ourselves and harming others. If you pray for if you cannot pray for others, there may be reasons why you cannot pray for individuals. Maybe they've harmed you and you cannot pray. You don't wish to pray for them, which is, you don't have to forgive. Islam does not make it mandatory to forgive. However, it does make it mandatory to be just. Even when those who've harmed you and wronged you, that you respond with justice. You don't respond with uh, oppression. So if somebody, for example, has wronged you, you don't want to pray for, for them. You don't want to forgive them. That is perfectly acceptable. You can, however, pray to God that you, you seek refuge to oppress or be oppressed. So again, that boundary of justice. You can seek as God to help you so that you are instruments of peace. This says that you're seeking justice, not forgiveness, but justice. And you want to protect yourself from oppressing as well as being oppressed. I want to discuss um, some of the reasons I focus so much on surrendering to God and also repentance is if we ever had discussions with individuals, a lot of times I have found that people have, like they don't like the Mosaic law or they don't like the 10 commandments or they don't like monotheistic faiths that have to deal with commands and rules, but they tend to lean towards Buddhism because they, of course, I'm not, I'm not here an expert on Buddhism, so I'm not speaking fully for Buddhism, but they spoke of Buddhism or they extracted from Buddhism concepts, which they like, which is to sort of nurture happiness, totally different than our understanding of what it means to nurture uh, peace. So their idea of is not resisting. Um, it's um, again, it's all about nirvana. It's about like just being kind of accepting the feelings of you know. Um, I think of the of being in union with everything and being just kind of at. A, a total peace. So it's more to do with nurturing certain feelings, not surrendering to commands of God. 
not here to like take a slingshot at Zen or, or Buddhism, but just to do a small, short snippet um, understanding to separate when I say Salam and with respect to Islam, how that is different than Zen. One thing I want to point out is when the Prophet upon him, peace and blessings, was at Mount Hira, and he received this, you know, inspiration and revelation from God. He was so traumatized that he considered, you know, throwing himself off a mountaintop. Now, some see this as a sign of him being crazy. Others, again, I don't like the cut and paste. Um, if you will, um, response of some individuals have to look at the whole story. Unless you look at the whole story of Prophet Muhammad, how he was with his spouse, how he was in the community, and so on and so on and so on, and then look at that part of his life, you're not going to get the full and true understanding of this incident. Others see it and realize that that trauma indicates something out of his control, thought and preparation or anticipation took place. Meaning, he did not make this up. Because when you're like trying to be at the mountain, like sometimes some monks will go again, not a slingshot at anyone. They will be totally like calm and they get to this inner peace and they're, they're, they're happy in there. But there's, you know, and they come up with all this cool wisdom that seems to be a reflection more of, of an ego than it comes from inspiration coming from God. This doesn't mean that the ego didn't come up with good ideas or good reasonable ways to resolve some issues. It's just still from the ego. It's from the self. This is where we get the self-love, self-compassion. Uh, I read a lot of books on that. Uh, self-forgiveness all comes from the self. It may be good and nice sounding, but it's not. it's totally different than inspiration from God. Another way to look at this story, and I mentioned this in the story of Maryam, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is how do the pure hearts respond to inspiration from God? If we had sent down this Quran upon a mountain, you would have seen it humbled and coming apart from fear of Allah. And these examples we present to people that perhaps they will give thought. So the response of Prophet Muhammad, if you will, right here, indicates to us or to those who are critically thinking about this situation, this isn't something he made up. Have you ever seen somebody who made something up or they plagiarized something or they stole something like a lamp? They don't respond like this. Or if they reached a level of Zen and they were trying to come up with, they had a reasonable intention, they want to help society, and they were trying to think of the most beneficial ways and wisdom that they could help society with, they don't respond like this. This is the response. Somebody who has lived up to 40 years, the society and the community bearing witness his trustworthiness, his honesty, his commitment to the community, his commitment to his wife, loyalty to his wife, being chaste, as I said, you know, he was a young, attractive man in a society that's not, you know, like right now we see hypersexualization. There was a lot of hypersexualization back then, yet he remained true, sincere, and chaste with his spouse. So this is not the response of somebody that ethical, that dignified, that, if you will, trustworthy and honest. This is the response of somebody who received inspiration, communication from a higher source, 
being God through the angels to Prophet Muhammad. Similar to Mary, similar to when the prophets were addressed, they always had this fear, which tells us that they did not make something up. Again, we're looking at the whole life journey. Somebody could be afraid, but they could also be their whole life journey was that they were afraid and they were uncommitted and they had they were constantly like engaged in things of they had like psychological issues, not to again mention any names, but here where you have to look at the whole story and then take this one in the context of that whole journey up to that point. This indicates to us. He received inspiration in what he's sharing with us. He's sharing from God. So here, as salam means we are surrendering ourselves to this message, to this inspiration, to these commands that God sent down to Prophet Muhammad, upon him peace and blessings. He was chosen. One of the names of God is the chosen of the Prophet Muhammad is the chosen one because he's trusty trustworthy, honest, and pure. If you ever had an encounter where you gave someone or you shared something with somebody and I was trying to like show this, I think I did share it one time where by the time it reached, I have to find it, but by the time it reached like, uh, I, I think I, I, I forgot to share it. I will share it maybe. Uh, by the time it reached the end of the line, you know, like, you know, three uh, degrees down or something, it was a totally ridiculous, totally different story. Um, because each person was, you know, speak, had kind of like polluted or diluted the message with their own, if you will, uh, nature. God chose Prophet Muhammad upon him peace and blessings because also he was the pure guide, Prophet Muhammad. He was someone who was purified to receive this message because it will shake you to be able to take it and to nurture and teach humanity to follow it. So this is what we mean here by peace. I'm just going to do a small comparison between Zen and between uh, between submission, surrendering one's will to the commands of Allah. So Zen, as people talk about inner peace nowadays, is about control and being in control, emotionally in control. It's not that we should be not disciplined, but that's 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 the goal. That's the aim of Zen. And Salam or peace is about surrendering to God. Our goal is to be following the commands of Allah. That's a grace and that's a gift. So here are some examples. Of course, there are other books. And again, I'm not like speaking for all Buddhists, but I'm just giving an example based on some of the healing movements and where kind of like the root of their understanding comes from. Care for embodiment. I open myself to loving my body. And that there's that whole issue of self-love. I am ready to delight in all my bodily senses. I am ready to care for and nourish my body. I am ready to rid myself of all shame and guilt. This is again where you deal with self-forgiveness. I am open, I open myself to loving my body as a miracle of my own life, as the growth of my integrity and spiritual life. It all points to the self. Whereas we take, I mean, for us, there's nothing wrong with somebody delighting themselves with their spouse. Just, and there are, for example, certain regulations for you to delight in things to make sure it doesn't harm you, but it also doesn't harm others. And we're not aware of that harm. And so we assume because it's making me happy that it's not harming others. And that's where the problem really um, begins. It's that false perception of what makes me happy is automatically not harming others. 
Here are some examples of prayers by Prophet Muhammad. Again, I have another section on Prophet Muhammad and the prayers from him, but here I gave a few. I also give a few in that other chapter, but I'm just focusing here on snapshot just to show the difference between our understanding of submission or peace through submission to God and what other, for example, cultures that has been widely accepted by the secularist movement here that they lean on to heavily to promote their understanding of peace. So for us, O oh Allah, I beseech you for guidance, piety, chastity, and contentment. So we want to be guided. We want to be pious. We want to be chaste. This doesn't mean, like, again, if you're married, you cannot enjoy sexual relationship with your wife. But again, it's bounded by uh, commitment, loyalty, and, and that you shoulder the full responsibility of those relationships, as well as contentment. Here, we're not asking to be happy, but we're asking to be content. Allah, forgive me, have mercy on me, guide me, guard me against harm, provide with me, provide me with sustenance and salvation. Make my religion easy for me by virtue of which my fears are protected. Set right for me my world where my life exists. Make good for me my hereafter, which is my resort, to which I have to return and make my life prone to perform all types of good, make death a comfort for me from every evil. This is not, again, an invitation to commit suicide, but what this means is that we look at death differently than other individuals do. That if it's going to harm your faith and God, for example, um, takes you early on, then it's considered a good thing or a merciful thing for you. Anything that may potentially harm your, your soul, that's for a decision for God to make. It's not that you're going to be suicidal or encourage others to be suicidal. Is that you have accepted life and you have accepted death and you are you know not that anyone loves to of course die but you've accepted and like kind of fear and hope you're also recognizing your you're between also life and death as well at any moment oh Allah I have considerably wronged myself this is again the importance of nurturing remorse whereas the other one was like it doesn't want to nurture remorse Here's the importance of nurturing remorse. There is none to forgive the sins but you. So grant me pardon and have mercy on me. You are the most forgiving, the most compassionate. Allah, I seek refuge in you from hunger. Indeed, it's the worst companion. I seek refuge in you from treachery. Indeed, it's a bad inner trait. Um, again, it's also about growth. The importance of looking inward and trying to perfect our characters and our uh, our inner traits. We would want God's help to help us look inward. I gave just a small here chapter because the book itself, you know, does is around reached the 194 pages. So I had to immediately like start cutting passages out of the book just so that it doesn't become bigger than it has reached. Um, in future releases of this book, I try to like get feedback. As I said, I'm open to correction. It may be turning into, uh, I will probably take this book and, and make it into two books, which will include the corrections and any feedback, as well as some of the ex extractions that I moved out. Uh, to make it easier for people to read right now because of the size, it could be like some might think it's a little bit intimidating. But I am open to your um, feedback on reading the book. I want to take you to some 
um, posts that I have shared on Facebook. And I hope to walk you through them as I reflect on why I shared those posts. We have to deal again with, we're asking you to reflect on the name of a salam. And so let me just share that, we'll push it there. Okay. First, I began with a piece uh, this is Al Fatah, the opener, the gates of profit and sustenance. So, this particular piece is by Dr. Ratib bin Nabilsi. And I like this particular quote that he has in this piece, so I would like to share it with you. Everyone claims he, she is right. Everyone heaps accusations against others. So, there are people, for example, that heaped accusations against Prophet Muhammad, the prayer peace and blessing. Everyone believes that he, she is a true believer while others are not. He, she is honest, trustworthy while others are not. He, she is so near to Allah Almighty and so intimate to him while others are not. This happens because among adherents of the same religion, what would the case be among adherents of different religions? Everyone accuses other religions as being forged and not God's. Again, or deviant and not rightly guided. The religious accuser religious a folly and foolish talk. So if, for example, Prophet Muhammad, upon him, peace and blessings, wanted to forge a book, if you ever looked at somebody, like look at examples of people who copy and forge others. Like I said, I know there's a misunderstanding between me and others, but this is not aimed at them. But just in general, Look at historically people who copied and forged others. What is their intention behind that? To promote themselves, right? And usually when people do that, they discredit those that they copied from. But if you read here, the Quran, and I'm going to talk about, we come to the understanding of Prophet Abraham from Prophet Muhammad, upon peace and blessings. So as I said, when... When you were having these discussions with others, they were talking about Prophet Abraham. They presented him in a very, very abusive manner. Uh, they spoke about him in a very uh, repulsive way. And here comes Prophet Muhammad, upon peace and blessing. And I'm going to share with what the inspiration was that Prophet Muhammad received of the reality of Prophet Abraham. So he's removing all of these false accusations, uh, false, if you will, uh, falsehoods against him, against children, pitting him, pitting their, his wives to, against each other. And he's presenting us the true and accurate narrative of Prophet Abraham. Why would he do that? Doesn't seem to match somebody who wants to copy others because usually when people do that, they want to promote themselves. There's an ego there. They want to promote themselves and they want to put other people down. They wouldn't take such an effort to remove all fabrications and falsehood of this prophet, all fabrications and falsehood of this other prophet, all fabrications fabrications of falsehood, and this other prophet. They wouldn't be doing something like that that doesn't add up to someone who forged and copied something. Doesn't add up to what we know of people who forge and copy or steal. Doesn't, doesn't add up to those accusations. So we can recognize that there are those who are making the accusation. But when we look at the evidence, it doesn't add up even his response, like I mentioned here. His response doesn't seem to add up. Usually when people copy, they tend to be like very, um, like God, they have God wrapped around their fingers. Um, and I mentioned like some individuals in the past, but because they were Christian, people assume that I'm just focusing on Christians. Uh, but in any faith, and somebody claims make such claims, 
and there's a lack of fear of God, a lack of kushua, uh, as we say. Um, you, you have to kind of recognize that the person is making things up. So the, his initial response to receiving inspiration doesn't add up with somebody who just made stuff up. Usually like when someone is trying to come up with wonderful wisdom to share with others and they've reached that inner peace, they come, they start to be sharing things in a very peace, relaxed, um, uh, open, like, you know, way. They would not be like, as I said, when it came down to Mary, it, it shook her apart. People said she was in despair, and I saw it as, no, she's not in despair. She's receiving inspiration from a higher source, which naturally, when they are pure of hearts, this is how they respond. To continue, everyone accuses other religions, I said, is it being forced? So people make those accusations about Islam and Muslims. And even those who are secularists, they will, you know, make mockery and, uh, and ridicule at Islam or even faith in general. And people will respond at the fact or they will say that, you know, secularists have no morals. But how do we judge? And who has a decisive verb? And who's the one who determines whether this or that party is right or wrong? It is Allah al-Fattah, the best judge. This is the second meaning of Allah's divine name. Al-Fattah, the just judge, which is derived from the Quranic verse, our Lord, judge between us and our people in truth, for you are the best of those who give judgment. However, what should be our attitude towards this divine name of Allah? Here I'm talking about the divine name, Al-Fattah. If you're on the right side, you know, don't be afraid because Allah is Al-Fattah. The just judge. People will speak badly about Islam or they'll speak badly about Prophet Muhammad and they may heap false accusations against uh, Prophet Muhammad, calling peace and blessings. But if we believe strongly in our faith, then we follow the words of Allah. So put your trust in Allah. Surely you're on the manifest truth. This is how truth responds. And say Allah sent it down. So like I just said in my uh, word document, Allah sent it down and he chose Pro Prophet Muhammad as the one to send it down to. Because otherwise, the message, if you've ever, like, shared something with anyone, it can be, like, you know, benign or anything. By the time, like I said, I'll show you a video after or put it in the description. By the time it reaches, like, four or five people, it will be a totally whole new story. So God sent it down, and he sent it down to Prophet Muhammad because he's trustworthy and honest and can receive the message sent it down to me or to anyone else we probably would not be able to fully receive it given like i said our hearts need to be polished and purified to be able to receive that inspiration or that message from god so we say allah sent it down this is to us what it means to be in peace is that Allah send down a message and send down, if you will, commands of how we should coexist in harmony with each other. To move forth with that same concept, I'm going to skip this because this is just preparing us for those hijri and prayers that we should make. Some of the criticism against faith and is because people, Seculars don't like rules. They don't like commands, particularly divine commands. And so they're always looking for ways to escape the consequences of those violations or transgressions of the divine commands. 
in conversation with them, they've always like raised the issue, can Islam be criticized? Can we criticize Islam, Islamic law? Uh, and are we allowed to like criticize uh, parts of the Islamic religion? And so my response to them is the same way. Can secularism, can secularists accept, tolerate criticism? Can we openly, not just be, you know, again, on the side, marginalized, uh, talking, you know, and, and barely like being uh, heard, but can we speak? Can Western movements that are expanding be criticized? Can liberals withstand reproach? Now, when I was... I was raised in the U.S., was born in Jerusalem, Palestine. I was raised in the U.S. Initially, when you saw this, the free speech debates where they talked about Islam, they always would bring somebody either who was hostile to Islam, uh, somebody who rejected Islam, somebody who may be ignorant of Islam, or somebody who might have a little knowledge of Islam, uh, probably not sufficient knowledge of this. And so they would have this discussion and they would give you this framing such that you were, you felt like something is missing. You know, I talked about lying through a mission. And this is what I see and as every critical thinker checks to checks the lying through a mission part of the framing. And so when I went through and started to research this, whether it's about Palestine, even like Islam, I found that the arguments were phenomenally strong when they were framed in a way that they were guaranteed to win, you know? But they were not like Moses facing the top musicians. So if as I had mentioned in many presentations, like locally, I, I would tell people, if you feel very strong about what you are bringing forth, then you want to be a contender. Why not bring forth the top intellectuals, the top minds, the Muslim community, and address the issue of whatever it is that you want to bring forth say that this is a positive contribution to the community. But do it openly and do it transparently, not just once, but every time you're discussing Islam, that's how it needs to be done. That the platform has to be such that you open yourself to criticism, you open yourself to reproach, you open yourself to considering the possible harm of what you are pushing forth in society. So despite the positive changes secularism has brought, we're not going to sit here and just condemn secularism and then kind of promote Islam. That's not how Islam comes about. It's essential to recognize there are many benefits that secularists have brought forth, but they should not be blind to the many harms that those some of you know some of these movements have brought forth. One of the drawbacks of secularism is that it can foster a closed-minded outlook and lead to the persecution, coercion, and indoctrination of individuals who hold opposing views. So while they're very loud behind the free speech debates. We saw this with the Charlie Hebdo. They're not as secure and confident in opening the platform to the top minds of the Muslim community. Political, social, or cultural movements should avoid emotional manipulation to justify their cause such as pity-based arguments or emotional blackmail. All movements must adhere to the principle of enduring the fire of scrutiny and criticism if truth is on their side. This is just like I said, for me, for anybody, you can't bring something out to the community, whether it's small community, bigger community, without facing the fire of scrutiny. People have a right 
to protect themselves from harm. Just like I say, when I'm going to be bringing something, I, when I used to be a blogger for the Star Tribune or as a columnist for a year for the Pioneer Press, share your ideas openly because people can push back and they can criticize you and say, they disagree with you. It has to be like this. Either the individual that's going to be impacted by what you say has to have an equal or a greater platform to respond. And if they do not, if you're just speaking about others, and they do not have that equal or greater platform to respond to you, then what you're engaging in is not promoting good for society or um, nurturing a higher understanding of what is good for society or criticizing something you think is harmful to society. What you're really doing is you're engaging in tactics of domination. You don't feel secure and you don't feel confident that what you have to bring can withstand the heat of scrutiny and the, and, and the fire of the people like responding. So you need to shut them down and then speak uh, to them or speak about them without them ever being heard and what their arguments are regarding what you are sharing and addressing. This principle applies not only to the grassroots movements, but to those in positions of power. Leaders must be held accountable for their actions and decisions and should be willing to engage in open dialogue with those that they are talking about. This fosters a culture of transparency and accountability, which is essential for a healthy society. It also ensures that those in power are representing the interests of the people they serve without harmful agendas as these only serve to undermine their credibility and legitimacy. Muslims cannot ignore that every prophet and messenger was subjected to the fire of scrutiny to prove their truthfulness and truth they want to bring to society. Every prophet had enemies, and we must and we have to, as Muslims, prioritize those who withstood such trials over those who cannot handle criticism. So we have evidence of Prophet Muhammad upon him, peace and blessings. Withstanding such a trial. Now the message that he brings tells us we may not have, for example, sufficient evidence about the other prophets, but the message that he brings, the narrative that he brings about those prophets, we have no reason not to trust that message, given that He's a witness for those prophets, and his narrative is trustworthy when he shares that message, given that he withstood and he went through that fire of scrutiny and came out again um, as someone who's trustworthy and honest, carrying a message from a divine. It also tells us, and there is no reason for him to praise or to promote the narrative of Prophet Abraham that this that may be at odds with other narratives. But he tells us the Prophet Abraham upon in peace, the message that Prophet Muhammad brings, questioned the people during his time. As a result, it was physically thrown in the fire. So here I shared some verses from the Quran. Has thou not turned thy vision to one who disputed with Abraham about his Lord? Because Allah has granted him power. Abraham said, my Lord is he who giveth life and death. He said, I give life and death, said Abraham, but it is Allah that causes sun to rise from the east. Do you then cause him to rise from the west? Thus was he confounded who in arrogance rejected faith, nor does Allah give guidance to a people unjust. So as a response, 
His people said, burn him and support your gods if you are to act. So this is a typical response that we see from individuals who do not want to accept criticism openly, transparently, uh, regarding what they are promoting in society. Allah said, oh, fire, be coolness and safety about Abraham. And they intended for him harm, but we made them the greatest losers. So this is, again, the argument of faith. In this blog, I explore it using the works of Sheikh Sharawi. I would encourage you to read the blog. More importantly, to review the video, it's in Arabic by Sheikh Sharawi. You can easily find or bribe an Arab to sit down and translate it for you. Make sure it's someone who's trustworthy in their translation. And then... Reflect on that understanding that Sheikh Sharawi shares about faith having a strong argument. To go forth, we, we are in the month of Dhul Hijjah. And I would like to share again, there's abundance of lessons to be derived from the life of Prophet Abraham and his noble family of Palm and Peace. We learn how important it is not to be deceived by the material world. I mentioned on Twitter about Hierapolis. I have the link right here. This is the post of June 21, 2023 on Engage, Minnesota. So I mentioned it here. This is the, Hiero, the, the tweet on Hierapolis, and I, I will discuss it also here as, as we go forward. Just share it here. I had more than one tweet on it, but we went to see Hieropolis, and the guide at the time was telling us that um, this town, the city, the the woman, you know, she wanted like the the king to build her a city, and this is the polis means city, and her name is Hiero, so it was called the city of Hiero or Hieropolis. And so she told us to raise our, um, you know, our standards, like when you want something, raise, raise your standard. And so we looked at it, and it was a city that later on was, you know, destroyed because the Greeks came and so on and so on. Other people came. And every time somebody came, a tyrant came. This is human tyrants. We all have that tyranny uh, amongst all human uh, beings. If they are not purified, then we become tyrants. And we try to dominate and we try to subjugate people to our, our will. One of the things that tyrants do, and this is a, a source that I have shared on Twitter, is in the, in, in the brainwashing uh, process, the agent systematically breaks down the target's identity to the point that it falls apart. The agent then replaces it with another, another set of behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs that work in the target's current environment. This was a response, he's a cognitive scientist, and I'm, I love cognitive science, uh, by George Lakoff. He's saying that one of the things cognitive science teaches us is that when people define their identity by a worldview or a narrative, or a note of thought, they're unlikely to change for that simple reason. It's physically part of their brain, and so many other aspects of their brain structure would also have to change. That change is highly unlikely. So my, my response to that was, as human beings, when we don't surrender to God, as I, I have just been sharing with you, what happens is we become tyrants. And what do tyrants do? Well, tyrants do what they know how to do, which is that to dominate, to subjugate others. And one of the means that they use to subjugate and dominate others is brainwashing. And so they try to break down other individuals. We see this historically um, to the point that their identity falls apart and then it's replaced with another set of behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs that work in the target's current environment. You look at historically an example of the Native Americans and boarding schools. This is an example. Um, the educational centers in, that's taking place in China. 
another example. You know, it could be ISIS and certain individuals. Again, we're talking about here tyrants, individuals who are not, um, uh, if you will, surrendering to God's will. So it could be religious people or maybe like extremists within the religious faith. And how do you identify those? Well, they want other people to surrender to God, but they're not surrendering to God. I'll give an example of that, but it could also be within Muslims. They want people to surrender, but they don't want to surrender. Now, the cure for that is not to dump revelation, nor is it an argument against revelation, because revelation recognizes that. And it calls out such individuals. And the cure is just as you're asking other people to surrender, you too must surrender because you can't be at peace if you're not surrendering. You don't become and coexist by telling other people to surrender to God's commands while you yourself are not surrendering to God's command. That's going to naturally create tension. I have to surrender and you have to surrender. This is how that peace can take place in that harmony between us because we all have an ego. If I don't surrender my ego, but I want you to surrender yours, there's going to be tension. There's going to start that cycle of hate and viciousness. So Islam recognizes extremism. It also calls it out. And it also has a cure and a solution for it. And the cure and the solution is not to dump religion, not to dump uh, a divine scripture or revelation and then to come up with our own man-made religion. It's simply, again, I surrender and you must surrender too. So to keep, to go back here, so the difference about the story of Hierapolis and other ruins and stories of the prophets, well, throughout history, as I said, tyrants have relentlessly attempted to impose their beliefs on entire cultures, often resorting to violent, oppressive, and disrespectful behavior towards the rights of others. At times, they were successful, and all that remains are ruins. Other times, they were kicked out, and the town recalibrated to its original culture and beliefs. While most people have fought back and risen against their oppressors, many were remolded into a version of their oppressors while others reclaim the spirit and faith of their roots. See this, for example, in Algeria. After 150 years, like slowly Algeria started to now, is recalibrating back to its Arabic culture as well as to their faith. For a while, they used to speak French more than they used to speak Arabic. Once they, once they removed and they got rid of the colonization, and the colonizers, then they were able to slowly, again, recalibrate and reclaim the spirit of their faith and their roots. Still others over a span of hundreds of years accepted an invitation from newcomers or traders to change their faith out of conviction. An example of that is Indonesia. So like fruits wish to bear fruit, such people reconnect to their spiritual roots and by doing so, to the rope of God, which you've held tightly to, we will never be lost. We cannot prevent tyrants from coming through. We can prevent them from reinventing us in their image. So I shared here a quote by a Palestinian poet, Abu Salma, why we need a book and a worldview. So I, I acknowledged, you know, the scientist, the cognitive scientist, George Laptop. But here's again a response of why we need a book and a worldview. Say to those who have committed crime against my homeland, before you other tyrants have passed through, do you see any trace of them now? They are gone. So if we study how tyrants over time overpower communities and destroy them in the various means that they use, we understand why we need a source of truth. And we need to refer to that source of truth to have 
conversation with ourselves and others that's based on integrity, honesty, and uh, again, uh, truthfulness. So here I mentioned, when I'm talking about the blessed month of Dhul Hijjah, talking about Sarah and Hijjah, our sisters in faith. Again, why we need a world, a book, and a worldview. If we just trust ourselves to come up with our own interpretation of things, this is why I began this particular one with Prophet Muhammad and his receiving revelation, why we need to guard that revelation. As human beings, we all have egos. And I like, again, that quote by Dr. Rathab al-Nabilsi. And we build or we pollute the truth with our own malice and biases. For too long, Sarah and Hajar were pitted against each other. And it's Isaac and Ismail were pitted against each other. Now we could blame religion, or we can actually look at the origin of sometimes where that tension comes in, where that rivalry comes in. It comes really at the root of the story. And when having discussions with Christians over the years, and even, for example, Jews, it comes at the root of this story. We have to share our narrative of this story from the revelation that we have received through Prophet Muhammad. And how when we reflect on this narrative, we can see how this narrative can actually nurture peace and coexistence between us. Then the one where Ajar and Sarah are against each other and where Ismail and Isaac are against each other. Some of the facts, and again, I talk about the psychologist fallacies. We're always speaking for others instead of allowing them to speak for themselves. Abraham and Sarah were banished by Abraham's family and came to Palestine as refugees. A tyrant took possession of Sarah due to her strength of faith. He was hit with a calamity to free himself. He let her go with Hagar as a gift to serve her. Sarah gave Abraham Hagar as a wife, hoping she would bear him a son who would inherit the covenant. We saw that in the Zechariah uh, story where he wanted a son, but his reasoning for wanting a son was to inherit the covenant and to take that torch forward. Sarah was a firm and loyal believer. We value her. We revere her as Muslims. She reached a very old age and wanted to aid his mission. The stories of Sarah and Hajar can help us ask questions about patience, generosity, and sacrifice. In this video, I have responded to Christians who compared again, who pitted Sarah against Hajar and Ismail against Isaac. I can't go through the whole video again, but if you are interested, you can reflect on what I have shared here in Sisters in Faith, Sarah and Hajar, Sisters in Faith. So going forth, I also discussed the names of God as As-Salam, and I discussed this in the past two incidents where I was invited as a speaker and for a play. And also, I was just invited to come to an event to the Humphrey where there were foreign policy experts, like top foreign policy experts, who were talking about their attempts to make peace in the Middle East. Basically, if we look at Palestine right now, currently, and we look at how, for the past 75 years, all attempts to bring peace to that just small region, how we have been unsuccessful. Why? What we've offered Palestinians is the following. If you stay and behave well as foreign residents in your homeland, you should expect oppression and violence from Israeli settlers. And over time, respond, respond warmly and again, peacefully to being ethnically cleansed. As our settlers who violated their own Torah, 
as I said, refuse to be sincere and true to God and remain in exile, and said decided to play God. So what happens when you don't, again, submit, surrender to God's teachings, is you end up finding an unprotected group of people that you try to dominate. You may use religion, you could use secularism, you could use science, but again, tyrants do not surrender to God's will. Talking about yourself, first and foremost, you will always be looking for someone that you can dominate, that you can subjugate for egoistic purposes. You may, again, claim religion, or you can claim otherwise, but it's, it's a reality that if you open your eyes, we can see. If you don't surrender, you are going to be a tyrant, and you are going to be subjugating and dominating others. The other solution that they give Palestinians is if you submit to this new interpretation of the Torah, not the traditional historical 3,000 years ago interpretation of the Torah that passed through generations, but to this new interpretation, because we defied God, the extremists, and we disobeyed God, and we said, hey, you're taking a long time, we don't want to be in exile, so we want to come up with a new interpretation. Now, we want to oppose those, you know, again, those traditional ethics and teachings of the Torah. This is, again, the mentality that we're, we're witnessing is, is taking place. So we don't want to submit to the traditional ethics of the Torah, but we want you, the Palestinians, to submit to this new interpretation of the Torah. Again, it's that mentality, that spirit of when you don't surrender to God, to what you believe conscientiously is the truth, you will dominate others who submit to your will and your egotistical desires. Third solution that they give Palestinians, if you flee, because you know the situation is difficult to live in, you risk being drowned at sea, forever detained in refugee camps, as we are seeing across uh, the world for Palestinians. If you make it out of the refugee camps, you will lose your citizenship as a Palestinian. You're no longer now a foreign resident. You're now stateless. Or if you're giving citizenship in foreign lands, it's with the condition that you do not speak out against Israeli oppression. Fourth solution is if you respond by fighting back, you'll be blamed for hating those who are oppressing you. You'll be accused of loving violence and hate, being hateful. And murdering you and persecuting you will be justified as acts of self-defense. These are the four solutions that, if you look at Palestine, that Palestinians are given by individuals who are experts in peacemaking. And this is what they have handed over to Palestinians as solutions. Again, if you don't surrender your will to the commands of God, you will find an unprotected group that you will dominate and subjugate to surrender to your desires and egos. And if you go to, again, this was shared on June 23rd. It has a link to the older piece on, of June December 26, 2016, something around that time. You can go and explore that and go in more detail again about the play, which was at the Guthrie that I was invited to for the Humphrey Institute um, discussion that took place. But there was just a lot of ridicule and mockery about why there isn't peace in the Middle East without reflecting on the solutions that we have offered Palestinians, if it was offered to us, we would not be accepting of such solutions. This gets me back 
come back to end the presentation. When his Lord said to him, Abraham, surrender thyself unto me. And he answered, I have surrendered myself unto thee, the Lord of all worlds. So we come to this realization that if we don't surrender, we become little or big tyrants. And in, when we come to this realization, and we genuinely and truthfully love ourselves to the point not that we want to like enjoy bodily just pleasures, but we want to be decent human, uh, affected in character, then we would turn to God and we would want to be purified and protected such that we would want to also be given the grace and the gift of bowing our will like Abraham, like Prophet Muhammad, upon and peace of blessings and prophets to God. So idea here is to love, to nurture ourselves, to love, to surrender to God and to reflect on what happens to us and what we become, whether we're cognizant or not cognizant of it. We're aware or not aware, our intentions are nice or not nice. What happens to us when we do not surrender our will to God? We become tyrants, become enablers of tyrants. So here I left with some prayers from the Quran. We should use to turn ourselves to God and ask God to make us Muslims, being surrendering to his will and make our children, because we want the best for our kids, a people who also surrender to his will and to show us our place for celebration of due rights and to turn unto us in mercy for thou art of returning most merciful. So I end here with quite, I, I shared some of the prayers of Prophet Abraham, which was shared, trusted to Prophet a Muhammad, upon peace of blessings, to share to the rest of humanity. And then this is um, one of the another again, the names of Allah Islam. So I wanted to share some other works that have been exploring the name of, of him, of excuse me, Allah Islam, the attribute, the name of God. And let me not be in disgrace on the day when men will be raised up. This is the prayer of Prophet Abraham. The day whereon neither wealth nor sons will avail, but only he will prosper that brings to Allah a sound heart. And again, what is a sound heart? It's not someone who's happy all the time, sweet talking, has a beautiful smile, you know, blah, blah. It's someone who is actively turning to God, actually, continuously, seeking to surrender their will, not asking just others, but they're seeking to surrender their will to Allah. That's Qalb and Salim. With respect to God, remember, Salam is perfection, devoid of any defect. Respect to human beings, it's surrender. So Salim, Qalb and Salim, comes from the same root letters as Salam, and Islam, it means surrendering to God's will. That peace is attained through surrendering to God's will. That's what it means. So it's not about how sweet, loving, kind you look on the outside. It's about are you surrendering to God's will actively? Then you are in peace and harmony. And this is the last one that I shared this morning, uh, actually yesterday morning, because today is right now, 2.30 a.m. right now. It's the name or attribute of Allah, Islam. so I'm about to just summarize the presentation. It's used only one time in the Quran. It's in the chapter, Surah Al-Hashr, chapter 59. If you look for it, go down to verses 22 and 24. It's in actually verse 23. And so it says, Allah is he whom there is no other God who knows all things, both secret and open. He is most gracious, most merciful. Law is he than whom there is no other God, the sovereign, the holy one, the source of peace and perfection, the guardian of faith, the preserver of safety, the exalted in might, the irresistible, 
the supreme glory to Allah, high is he above the partners they attribute to him. Is Allah, the creator, the evolver, the bestower of forms or colors to him, belong the most beautiful names? Whatever is in the heavens and on earth does declare his praises and glory, and he is exalted in might and wise. So right in the middle of a bunch of attributes and names of God, where he introduces himself to us, is the name here. as source of peace and perfection. So if we want to perfect our character and we want to purify our character and we don't want to be little or big tyrants, then we turn to a salam and we seek to be like Abraham, surrendering our will to God and cleaning our hearts from any impurities or defects that it's, it's a natural reality of being in this world, it will absorb. So these three verses emphasize not only his soul divinity and true majesty and creator, but embedded, as I said, is the attribute of salam without any defect. We are wise if we want to be, you know, to grow and not to be corrupt people because it's easy to condemn corruption, but it's difficult to work on oneself, not to be a corrupt individual in society. Then we should be actively looking at it as a good thing to purify and protect ourselves. When I speak or write about the human condition or imperfections, the aim is not that we celebrate our imperfections and accept them. It's that we surrender to God and we seek to be purified and protect, perfected. This path is taken not out of hatred or judgment of ourselves or our condition. It's that, as I said, the nature of the world, you can't be walking in, in this world without absorbing the reality of this world and becoming spiritually sick. So just as we physically go to a doctor and we have annual physical exams or we seek medical treatment, we should also recognize that given the nature of this world, we will get spiritually sick and continuously and perpetually work on purifying ourselves and perfecting our nature. So I shared some verses from chapter 91, verse 7 to 10, by the soul in the proportion and order given to it, it's enlightenment, it's right and wrong. Truly he succeeds that purifies it and he fails that corrupts it. So here it's to kind of asking you to use your reason. person who loves reason would recognize that it's in their interest and it's in the interest of society that they work on purifying and protecting and perfecting their nature and their soul. We understand, I gave here as an example, that if we don't clean our homes or our bodies or our gardens, that you know they become defective or diseased. So again, using our reason, like I mentioned in the last video, they do not listen, use their intelligence. They would not have faced these consequences. So using our reason, looking at history, there are many examples of tyrants. Uh, so by constantly recalibrating our soul to surrender to its creator, we are taking our soul, purifying it and perfecting it. And it's not a one-time occurrence. As long as we live in this world, this is a never-ending process. So we should not grow tired of it and hate it. Instead, we should train our hearts to like it, to love purity, to like perfection, to love the act of purification and perfecting our nature. This is accomplished by also joining whatever is in the heavens and on the earth and declaring his praises and glory. We stop with this egotistical praising of ourselves and we start to praise God, as salam, the perfect. And we seek to also have a perfect nature. Look at like all of the attributes that that name is surrounded by. You know? We look at all the attributes of God that it's surrounded by the holy. We want to be pure. 
We want our faith to be guarded. We want to be secure. Uh, so it's essential that we want to be connected to, um, to, to God. And by reflecting on those attributes, we're training our hearts to love perfection and to love purity and to actively seek it. Others, of course, may disagree with this, but this is what our understanding of our faith is, and this is what we share forth with others who may want to call us away from our faith, and they might want to put, like, for example, what I mentioned with the issue of Zen, promote self-love and self-compassion and self-forgiveness, and, you know, and, uh, being uh, kind of like nurturing feelings of being happy while being totally unaware that that happiness, how we may be happy, is actually harming ourselves or harming others. Or if we are aware, we may have rationalized and convinced ourselves with justifications and rationalizations that such individuals are maybe either savages or terrorists or whatever label we put on them, or they may be just not human. Whatever label we decide to put on them boils down to, which is the aim of this presentation, if we don't surrender to the commands of Allah, we will subjugate, dominate, and oppress others. And do you want to do that is the question that I leave you with. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.